Hi everyone, we'll get to start in just about a minute. We're just waiting for a few more people to join us today, but thank you all for being here. All right, I'm gonna say we can get started with our introductions and uh, people will try to learn soon. So yeah, hi everyone. Welcome to unit six of ROSES 2021. We're really fortunate today to have Dr. Aaron Velasco present today's lecture on digital signal processing. Dr. Velasco, as an introduction, received a PhD in seismology from the University of California, Santa Cruz in 1993. After receiving his PhD, Dr. Velasco worked at the Science Applications International Corporation and then at Los Alamos International Laboratory to improve the US's capability to detect underground nuclear explosions. In 2002, he accepted a position at the University of Texas at El Paso, where he's currently a professor. We are also really fortunate to have David Guanaga with us today, who will also be presenting and in particular helping us to the exercises. David Gunaga, very soon to be Dr. Gunaga, is a student in the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Texas at El Paso. So to all of you, feel free to post questions to the presenters through the chat or through the Q&A box below. And yeah, without further ado, Dr. Velasco, feel free to take it away. Good morning. I just want to share also that uh, David uh, just successfully defended his dissertation. I'm, I'm announcing that to everyone that will hear. And uh, so he's Dr. Guanaga as soon as he turns in his dissertation, which will be sometime this week. So uh, great success story. And uh, he can you can ask him questions later about where he's heading and, and whatnot. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about digital signal processing. And so I'm going to go ahead and, and start a, a lecture. And the way I'm going to do this today um, and the way um, I generally uh, lecture is I ask a lot of questions. And, um, uh, and my first question is, where is my lecture? There it is. All right. And it, it's just a way for me to, to understand that, that you're out there. And, and I understand that, uh, you know, generally with this large of, of group, sometimes it's hard to, to, to answer things and get a response. So, um, so if I ask a question and I'm pausing, I'm pausing so I can get a reaction. So feel free to write in the chat um, the answers to that. Um, this topic itself, when they first asked me, is, is a challenging one because I actually think it's the foundational, it's really foundational for seismology. And so how do you teach it in two hours? Um, that, that's the trick. And so we're, we're gonna basically do the best hits, if you will, and to kind of skip uh, some, uh, some of the other elements that I normally teach. In fact, I'm teaching this course in fall and, and I, you're gonna see notes here that are way more involved than, than, um, than we need to, to you know, get into today. We just don't have the time to do that. So we're gonna to try to highlight some things that I think are really important to understand and some things that you may have heard or heard, uh, not heard. I have was able to go through the um, Slack um, introductions and I see that many of you are already PhD students or some of you are masters and so and it's hard for me to gauge what the math the the, the math backgrounds of you all so I, I'm let me first apologize for those that are really advanced and then you know uh, apologize for those that are that are just getting ramped up and if I if I've missed that mark so I'm going to try to hit some to to the to the to the to really just foundational sort of um, uh, concepts today and not really heavily on the math. And, and, and uh, of course, uh, you know, we rely on digital signal processing in our daily lives. Um, uh, you know, if you like to listen to the radio, what, you know, you, you listen to a channel, what, what does that mean? You know, what does that, what does that specifically mean? Um, when you, you know, uh, want to, you know, for some of you, at least in my neighborhoods, you know, my old neighborhoods, you know, like to, like to listen to their, excuse me, listen to the bass, 
right? Stronger. What, what exactly is that going on? And you hear a car going by and boom, 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 blasting the music, you know, and then others like don't like that sound. And so you hear some, some other things that are going on. Um, so just in general, can someone just tell me what, 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 what concepts we're using just when I'm talking about the radio? What are some of the concepts? I'm trying to see where my participants are in my chat. Amplitude and frequency, actually, that's frequency. That's absolutely right. So when I want to listen to bass, I'm actually lowering the higher frequencies, and then I'm I, I am increasing. Um, uh, yeah, there's amplitude AM and and FM, right? Amplitude uh, modulation and frequency modulation. Those that's all signal processing. Everything it's it's part of your everyday life, um, and so it's part of your everyday life in seismology. And the foundational observation of seismology is a seismogram. And if you really think of what a seismogram is, I always write this. Um, it's basically some sort of displacement as a function of time. And if I wanted to do it in two dimensions, I could. But um, that's a basically um, a function of the source. And we're going to convolved with the propagation, convolved with the instrument. That's, that's what our foundational knowledge is of seismology. So, but there's interesting terms here. What are these things? Well, that's a convolution. We're gonna get into that today and what that specifically means. And what it really is, it's a filter. And so exactly the same concepts as you think about uh, your radio, those are filters that, you, that you're applying to a signal that's coming through to your radio and it's being beamed um, in a certain way. And you're, you're, you're able to uh, modulate the frequencies, if you will, um, to get the sound that you to, that you uh, that you enjoy, whether it's a heavy bass or whether it's it's the the high frequencies or the or the treble is what what that's called, and then of course in music you know um, uh, you know there's the the bass clef and the treble clef and those are really based on frequencies that's that's the 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 the, the separation there so th this is sort of the foundational knowledge but there's a key word here digital. Can anyone tell me what that means? What does digital mean? And I'm looking at the chat. Discrete sampling. Perfect. That's exactly right. It's discrete. So what does that really mean? So if we look at a signal here. <clears throat> uh, where's my figure? Uh, it'll be down. Let me just go, I'm just going to start with a very basic signal. I'm going to have to do this. <clears throat> okay. What we're looking at is an analog signal. This is a, some sort of, you know, sinusoidal or whatnot. And we have basically some sort of continuous signal. And continuous basically means just continuous or analog is what that means. Um, it has no breaks in it. Or um, digital, which basically means I sample <clears throat> this signal with discrete points so that I can manipulate it in a bunch of different ways. Okay, so um, there's the number of samples that I've, that I've circled right here. There's all these different elements. You know, what happens, and we're going to do this sort of exercise in a very, I'm doing this in a very high level. You know, if, if you sample every fifth point or something like that, and I were to, to draw it on a computer, it would look something like this, right? And I'm suddenly distorting the signal just by how I sample it. So to understand seismology and, and seismograms in a meaningful way, you've got to really understand, you know, what is it is that we mean by discrete, um, and whatnot. So, so, uh, and and what the impact is, and we're going to learn about the frequency domain. So, there's different domains. There's there's different domains. There's the time domain. There's the frequency domain. There's the wavelet domain. If if you want to get into, that. well, I won't talk about wavelets at all today. Um, there's all different. There's the Z transform. So, there's the Z domain, if you will, and the Z transform is is a is a generalized version of the Fourier. Um, uh, transform, which we won't get into the math specifically, but that essentially that's what it is. So if you really look here, 
I go back to my, um, you know, DSP is really about, you know, uh, um, discrete sampling. And so, um, you know, continuous uh, means analog, digital is just uh, sampled. A filter, I've already mentioned about filters is basically an operation that that you uh, on a signal that modifies the output of a signal. The earth is one of those. The earth is, is it actually a filter. Um, and if you go back to my seismogram, you know that that's essentially what this is. This is the earth. Let me do a different color here. That P stands for the earth. And I I always I always joke that this is the spy, right? A seismogram is equal to spy, and that's basically source propagation and instrument. Okay, and so that, that really the earth is, is that filter and that convolution operator is essentially a filter. So it's, it's, it's creating that sort of out, outline. Um, frequency, you already have a, a concept on that, you know, um, uh, you know, higher frequency, higher pitches, lower frequencies, lower pitches and whatnot. Okay, so I won't get into any of these other um, things. So let's go ahead and, and talk about uh, discrete time signals. And, and there's a, it, when you see it in, in, in math, we always write you know, some sort of function of T. But in discrete sampling, we use N, where N is basically that sample that we talked about, those red dots on that signal. And you, you'll see some of the nomenclatures and depending on you know, what books you use or whatnot. These notes I, I wrote were uh, specifically not using Python, but MATLAB. Okay, and so um, I like to do a lot of stuff in MATLAB, but Python, whatever your, your program is, um, it doesn't matter, right? The concepts are the same, the math is the same. So we just have to figure out how to implement that. And David, David will get us through some, some of those exercises this morning. And as it, I said, we're gonna try to break this up. So I, I, I try not to, we'll do mini, I call it mini lectures and then get to some sort of exercise and then, and then uh, move forward. So there's some key concepts, of course, period and frequency, angular frequency, you'll see that a lot. Which is two pi that frequency. So you know, um, uh, frequency, and this is not the same f by the way. Is is basically in, in hertz or cycles per second, t's in, in seconds, um, and then uh, you have omega, which is in. And we we'll, we use that because we're, we're going to talk about a lot about angles. We're going to talk even about sines and cosines, which is really the foundation of Fourier analysis, Fourier transforms. It's actually sines and cosines. That does also impacts the way we look at things um, and whatnot. And so this is all sort of math notes we don't need to cover. But I, again, I've covered sort of a little bit about discrete and then you know how what a vector is and whatnot. And, and I, get, seeing all your backgrounds, I don't think uh, we need to cover any of that. But um, <clears throat> there's some key functions that we 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 consider. Um, you know, a delta function. Um, is something that we use a lot. And we, we talk a lot about impulse response of systems. We'll talk about, we don't have time today, but there's an impulse response of a filter. Um, and, and, you know, essentially you could think about, okay, you input a, a delta function and what's the output? That sort of, that's, you know, of your system. It's uh, a delta function in this case would be something very simple, you know, like this. It's supposed to be straight up and down. Don't draw very well um, <clears throat> and whatnot. In a discrete system, um, that's the way we would write it. And then you can talk about, you know, um, shifts um, in, in time uh, where n, uh, n represents a sort of time and all sorts of different things. And there's different functions you can do. A step function basically is represent, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about step functions today too. Um, that would be essentially a, a step function. And that's the way you would program it in, in other codes and whatnot. And, and we can go into that in a little bit. Um, all different types of operators that you need to understand. Um, um, uh, we won't get into uh, any of this um, or what it means to be convergent, but there's some really key things that I want uh, to walk, uh, walk you through, some really fundamental things. First of all, is that um, we can represent, uh, and, and this will come into play later, um, sines and cosines as, uh, or exponential functions as essentially power series, and and the, this so you can you can represent sort of these functions um, uh, as a series or or a, a, of of an additional an addition or subtraction or or both uh, as you move forward. And you can represent signals that way. But the really the the, the thing we want to start with today 
is something that you probably already know or you've already been introduced, but let's get a little bit more into the, to the math and then uh, uh, um, how we would go into it. Um, <clears throat> so before we do that, let's go ahead and jump into our first exercise for the morning. And it, it looks simplistic and, and I know it is, but we're gonna, we're gonna get into it, what we can do to understand sort of our discrete sort of analysis. So I'm gonna stop sharing and David is gonna start sharing his, his, his screen. Are there any questions for so far? I'm gonna, before we move on. Okay, so, uh, David, uh, um, David actually put this this notebook together, and and we need you to probably run that the, that first element. So if you could all do that right now, that would be great. <laughs> Go ahead and run it, and and um, uh, are there any questions? Okay. All right, so we want to look at sines and cosines today. And like I said, they're actually the elemental, uh, um, the basis functions, if you will, of Fourier transforms. And Fourier transforms allow you to, to, to um, look at things in the frequency domain and then allow you essentially to filter. Um, there's different really cool properties that convolution has, for example, that I, I already mentioned it, um, it, it. It's essentially a filter operator. But let's focus on this. So we have f, f of t is equal to a uh, sine omega t f. And so what that is, is it, it's an amplitude and a phase term, okay? And so that's what David's pointing at. So David, why don't you just step people through this particular set of code? Yeah, yeah. So um, here we're just kind of, and remember to make sure to run down <laughs> those imports and stuff above. But once you have that running, you can start running this code. There's nothing for you to really change here, but um, what it's basically doing is I'm going to calculate a sine wave um, and just show you that it's discrete when we work with, in Python or any language, really, we can't work with an infinite amount of points. It's just not, not possible, possible in the digital world, at least not at the moment. Um, so here, I'm just going to create a, a sine signal that has an amplitude of 2, a frequency of 10 hertz, and a phase shift of 0 0.9. I mean, you just can plug those in, right? So if you're like in a math class, you kind of do the same thing um, in, in Python. Uh, the function that I'm going to be using for sine is np sine. That's just numpy sine. Um, and then you just plug them in and you can hopefully follow along. If you have any questions, um, please um, feel free to um, shoot, uh, you know, uh, in the comment section, let me know and I'm ha more than happy to answer them. But something that you have to create um, a lot of times in a lot of these programs, including in Python, is you actually have to kind of create uh, an array of, of, of samples. So that's just how many times, like the points that you're going to actually measure something. Um, in this case, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm arranging it. Um, here, I'm gonna I'm gonna calculate four seconds, um, and it's gonna have a sample rate of one over fifty. So um, this is in hertz. So uh, that's just the sample points, and then when we plot it, um, that's what we get here. Um, and the idea, like um, like Dr. Velasco was saying, uh, these points are the actual data, and then this is kind of what's interpolated between. A lot of times when we plot things, we see this, and you might think that's continuous, but it's really not. Um, the, the, the computer's kind of just showing you, you know, what the points would look like between um, the lines. That's what this is showing. Um, next would be decimation. I don't know if you want to speak to that before I get to it. Or... Well, before we do that, um, actually, I want to I want to actually have people um, uh, yeah. change those values for um, yeah. the amplitude, um, for the the omega, and for the rho. And then I'm gonna I'll give you like. A couple of minutes just to mess with this. So I'll give it one more, one minute, if you will. I'm, I'll, I'll time it here. Um, I wasn't using my timer earlier. Um, and then I want you to, we're going to talk about it. Okay, so what's the impact of, of changing the phase? And what's the, um, the impact of changing the amplitude? So let's just go ahead and give you a minute. And to go ahead and, and to explore with that. Yeah, and I'll be playing around, I guess, so you guys can kind of get an idea of what it does. So, <laughs> but all you'll be doing, like, to, to edit that stuff is just change these numbers up here. Um, you don't have to. We're not going to really show you how to do a lot of plotting, so don't don't stress about the plotting stuff. You shouldn't need to change that. Just change the stuff up here. So, um, but go ahead and play around with it. And again, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to let us know. So just. 
And I'm just gonna kind of walk you through guys, I guess, just if you want, you're curious, you can look at my screen, but hopefully you guys are able to edit this too. <laughs> yeah, we'll just let him, let, him, let him mess with this for a little bit. Then we're gonna ask some questions about it. Okay, my timer just went off. Okay, so can someone describe to me uh, um, what happens when you change omega? And David was kind of doing that. So omega is an angular frequency. It increases the number of wiggles, the number exactly of what happens. What happens when you change, okay, more periods in the same time, very good. All right, so what happens when you change rho? Anyone notice anything? David, can you change rho? Yeah. There's, a, there's a, a radian phase shift of two pi. Two pi makes it a cosine. All right, so um, it rotates the amplitude to the left to right. So the, there's some sort of, go ahead and do that, David. So it's starting in a different place. What you're doing is a shift. It's, it's equivalent to basically a time shift in some respects in, in, in time domain, you see that. So the omega is, is, is really dictating the, 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 um, the frequency, the T, it, I mean, the rho is dictating how much is moving. Oh, someone, uh, Kimata is that able to plot something on the screen. Um, you should be able to run that, 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 the, it says DSP is discrete. Um, I don't know if anyone can, can, can help Kimata. Um, yeah, make sure you run this first too. Oh, so people can't see what they're, uh, what people are, are doing on the chat as, as going to panelists. Um, you might want to repeat the answers of post -up. Okay, so uh, Madison said uh, pi over over two. Um, Taylor says shift the amplitude uh, the signal starts at. That's exactly right. It's a time shift. It's, it shifts the signal. Uh, Jose basically says rotates the amplitude to the left and right. Came out to no plot on my screen. And then Su Suzanne. Um, good morning, Suzanne. Ho hopefully you're you're good. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so th there's there's a, a lot of answers. This is great. So this is exactly what we wanted to do. So <clears throat> so understanding this is really important. So you, you imagine so this amplitude and phase. So what happens with the change in amplitude when you change the a? Yeah, it increases or de so Gerardo basically says it increases or decreases the size of the signal. That's exactly right. So you could distort the signal in lots of different ways with just those those essentially three parameters that are really broken down in amplitude and phase. And of course, the base thing is the time, right? You need the time and the sampling that that it's there. So if if I you know um, so if it, 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 as David said, uh, mentioned, I can have infinite number of points to sample that size, size but th that sine wave. But that doesn't make sense, number one. And number two, um, um, you know, if I didn't sample it enough, I can end up with some problems of, of and, and that actually impacts how you look at things in the frequency domain. It really distorts the signal in a big way. But let's see how it distorts in um, the uh, time domain. So David, go ahead and take it away. Okay, so uh, kind of moving on. Um, I don't, uh, did, did you want me to just go through the code or did you have something to share for that for your notes or? For uh, no, go ahead and go through okay. the code. Okay, so um, decimation, this is just a process that we can apply to kind of sample the data a little bit differently, right? Um, and there's a lot of reasons you might do this. Some, you might wonder like, why would I want to destroy the signal? Well, um, 
like Dr. Velasco says, you can have a lot of points and sometimes it could be a little bit too big and a little bit too intense for your computations. Unless you have a supercomputer, you know, it's something you might consider like, oh, maybe I have too many points and I can get away with a smaller sample rate, you know, um, or if you need to save space in your hard drive, you might want to do this to your signals. Um, so something we can apply is called decimation or downsampling. Um, and again, this is just resampling the signal at a certain intervals to kind of, and hopefully not destroy the signal, keep it intact, but um, save a little bit of space because it's enough information to still recreate that signal. Um, and that's what's what I'm showing here. So um, here, if you were to run this, um, and hopefully you guys don't have any issues, um, um, it's, it's a decimation factor by four. So you see that I'm skipping every four points um, here. So this uh, gray line, this is the original signal that we had up here, right? Um, but then this dark blue one or these blue dots are now the new signal that I'm sampling once I decimate it. You can see that, you know, it's, it's a little bit harsh. It's a little bit hard, you know, it's not as nice looking as this one, but we could probably work with this. Um, and down here, I have a little bit of an exercise um, and I just want you guys to go ahead and um, you can copy and paste this if you want up here. It's a, you just got to run it. Um, but uh, I want you to sample it by a factor of, or decimate it by a factor of 25. So, or if you want, you could just change the number up here. That's okay too. Um, but change this, to, like get this to 25 and see what happens to the signal. Um, and that's kind of gets into what uh, Dr. Velasco was saying about being careful um, with your, with, you know, having enough, uh, uh, your sampling rate being appropriate for the type of signals you're trying to capture. So I guess we could give them a little bit of time for them to play around with that. See. So do you have a, you have the, the exercise right below that says decimal? Yeah, yeah, I do. I have it down here. You guys could just uncomment this if you want and write your own stuff. Um, but I think uh, <laughs> to save time, you might just want to change this value up here. It's the same thing. So like, you just like, if I wanted to um, change it to 10, that's what like there you go. Uh, decimation right. of 10 looks like. But do 25 and, and maybe let me know. Do you think that, do you think it's a good result? Do you think it, it captures the sine waves that we created? Yeah, so we have somebody say, the, no, the results aren't good. No, it doesn't. No, the, the not a good result. Lots of original signal is lost. And that's right. Um, and it's, if so, let me let me go ahead and plot this so everyone can kind of see. So yeah, and um, if you were to just look at this and you didn't have the original data, right, you would probably interpret this as a different signal. This this looks like a sine wave, but it's not the, um, or a cosine wave, but it's not the it's not the same signal that we had before. So this is a problem. Um, and this is uh, what we call an aliasing problem, um, just because we're not, um, we won't get into it. We just don't have the time to take a, take a DSP course in the future and I'm sure they'll get into it. Um, but there's things called like a Nyquist frequency and a Nyquist rate that you have to take into consideration when you're trying to sample a signal. Um, so let me just go ahead and show a quick note about that, yeah, David. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, this will be quick because we want to get to the other things too. Um, all right. So. Uh, what he's showing is essentially um, uh, where you um, <clears throat> cannot look at a signal at a certain frequency because you you've impacted um, uh, the sampling of that of that function. And what we usually call it is basically the the Nyquist here. And so the Nyquist is um, represented here, which is really one over. Uh, one over two times the sampling rate. So samples per second usually uh, is what we, we, we have. So um, that would be, um, what would you use there? So if, if you had a, if you sampled the signal at, at 20 Hertz, that's a sampling rate. Um, the, 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 the frequency at which you could really explore that signal is only 10 Hertz, essentially half of that. Okay, so that's the way to, 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 to view that. So, um, you can get yourself into trouble pretty quickly by analyzing signals that um, are beyond your Nyquist frequency. So, so this is again, it's based on sampling rate and whatnot. So this, this is really, really important um, as you move forward. So that, that Nyquist frequency is, 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 is critically important um, as you move forward. So that, the, and so aliasing is the term we use. Um, Nyquist helps us not so so uh, not uh, get into that realm 
you need to be below your Nyquist frequency so that you don't create aliasing problems. That's essentially what that means. And so that's, that's one of those really important things that, that you've got to walk away from. If there's anything you walk away from today, that should be one of them. Uh, really, really important. All right, so um, David has uh, done a very nice job at describing that and what's going on. So <clears throat> let's next step into our next topic um, today, and that's going to be um, uh, auto and cross correlation. I have to find my notes again because I'm jumping all around. Okay, let me share. Um, I think I'm sharing my screen already. Mm -hmm. And you can see all the different topics. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about correlation and autocorrelation. I know that many of you have probably been exposed to this. Many of you probably know it better than anyone. Uh, and that's because uh, you, you all, um, you know, maybe are doing projects related to that. Cross-correlation is something that, that we use often. And so the way we usually write the term is that it's really a, a multiplication of two signals that are, um, that are shifted and uh, shifted, multiplied, um, shifted, um, and summed. And uh, so that would be a, a cross correlation. Autocorrelation is something um, where you do that, you basically multiply the same signal to itself. And um, uh, essentially, um, it's going to tell you something about the signal. And, and really, what a cross correlation is doing is it's going to um, allow you to see how similar two signals are. And you know, in seismology, we do this all the time. There's, there's other, um, for example, um, uh, for the uh, technique on location, there's something called HypoDD, which is, uh, I don't know if you're going to learn that in this class, but it's a location technique that's a sort of, a, it's a relative location technique, but it also takes advantage of the fact that, you know, maybe um, two events look very similar in their cluster, and you can do a cross correlation and get precise time. So really, it's, it's the time they're really output, uh, the, the peak is where the signals are um, at the same time. And so in this particular case, L represents, these are all represents time. These are just different, um, different, um, uh, you know, um, um, variables that, 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 that allow us to write the math. So, um, <clears throat> so autocorrelation is, uh, basically uh, tells you how periodic a, a one signal is. If you get one peak, it's essentially, it, it's not periodic. If, if you get similar signals um, or trips in there, you're gonna see uh, um, uh, different sort of uh, output related to that. So correlation is two signals to see how similar they are. And that's essentially the math behind it. Um, and I think we have um, something for you to, to demonstrate that. Are there, are there any questions about that? I can never see, whenever I go into my share screen, I no can't see yet, the chat. I think. Okay, okay, great. So let's go ahead, David, and you take it away for the, let me just stop sharing here. Okay, so we're gonna start with autocorrelation um, here. Uh, and if you run this cell, um, all it's gonna do is just gonna plot you the original signal. So. We're gonna, we're gonna autocorrelate this signal. It's called a sawtooth signal. And we don't have to get into the specifics of it. Um, but I actually made a, a, a function that makes, that makes a nice little animation to hopefully kind of wrap your head around what an autocorrelation really does. Um, so we're gonna correlate these two signals, right? And it's the same signal. Um, and we're gonna kind of pass through. And the things to keep note is um, when the areas match up, that's when we have a high correlation. If there's an inverse, that means there's an anti-correlation. Um, and these are relative results. And like Dr. Velasco says, peak just means that there's a high correlation relative to its surroundings. Um, so if you click play here, um, you can kind of see as we progress through, um, this is applying that autocorrelation. You see as, as soon as it overlaps, you get that peak. Um, and we're not, I don't think we're gonna get too much into this, but there is a lag parameter and that's how this is plotted. So we see that as soon as we have, and then you can see the, so position zero is where um, so when these two match up right at the zero position, I could probably pause it as soon as it keeps, reaches that point. Um, see, that's, that's close enough. <laughs> I missed it by a little bit. Um, but you can see right when it matches up is when you have that peak. And that's because the, the areas underneath that curve, that signal overlap a lot. And that's what that correlation coefficient is, um, is outputting. So when we correlate, that's what we're doing it in a, in a signal processing. That's what that means in, in, in this run. Um, so with that, 
Um, the, how would you actually calculate this in, a, in, in Python? Um, so here you guys have a, a little cell enough and you can actually use this. And I'll just, uh, just walk you through it. You, you'd use this function. There's, there's plenty of other ways to do it. Um, I just find this to be kind of the easiest. So don't take it like, oh, there's, I know how to do it differently. This is just one way to do it. Um, so we're gonna be using SciPy and we're gonna be specifically using signal. Um, and then we, they have a function called correlate and you can give it two signals. Um, and the way you apply it is, um, I, I created the signal up here, it's called sawtooth. So you can just copy that. And that's kind of how you're gonna approach the rest of the cells. I'll help you out with this one, but hopefully in the later cells, you can kind of work it out yourself. Um, and you can just plug it in there and then run it. And then I have it so it plots and you'll see that it actually correlated them and it actually created that plot, right? So, um, but anyways, um, and that's kind of just showing the auto correlation. I'll kind of let you guys do it for the cross correlation. Um, do you want me to get to cross correlation or do you want me to? Yeah, off? go ahead and, and, and... Okay, well, so... Uh, okay, so going back to the auto correlation, you can see there's a peak at that offset of 300 and that's where, you know, that, that's really the, yeah. really should be the zero, right? Yeah, this is relative. I should probably change that. Right, and so, um, uh, you know, at, so in this case, 300 represents zero. It's just a, it's just a way it's pl plotting, but essentially um, it's of course correlated with self at zero. It's yeah, zero like the lag. peak there, at zero lag. So that, that, that's what's really important to walk away from. And that, that is really a nice, um, uh, um, a nice figure. So, you know, in, in some respects, we, it says correlation, but he, that's correlation because he's used the same signal twice. He uses a different signal that would be basically the cross correlation. So uh, if A or B. So, that, so in other words, you can use the same function uh, to do the auto and the cross correlation. Okay, so go ahead and, and step them through um, the cross correlation. Okay, so uh, cross correlation, we're going to be using this function. So we're going to actually correlate um, this signal with this one here. Um, and I want you guys to kind of test this out. See, hopefully you can run this um, and then you can play the animation and kind of see how it works out again. Um, and again, when you have these, so this is the zero um, line, right? So below that's negative numbers or negative, like a negative amplitude. So you'll see there's an anti-correlation there, but where they matches up, you get those correlation values. Um, and the way you would do that again, you just use that same function, but I kind of want to ask a question. Do you think the order matters that, that are correlate things? Um, and I want you guys to play around and tell me if it does. So go ahead and, you know, apply this um, correlation or cross correlation, and then just uh, switch the switch the direct or switch the signals that come first. Um, and you can let me know um, if it changes the actual output of the correlation in any way. Um, so you want to give them a minute to do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So go I'll ahead time it here. and just let me know. Okay, so what do we have here? What are, what are some answers to David's question? So repeat your question. Yeah, so did the order matter? So when you can plot it here, right? So you could just, again, you could use that function signal.correlate and then you can put your two signals and I have them already defined. So you could have just put, you know, the step function here. Hopefully you guys can read that. Hopefully text not too small and then sawtooth and then run it and see if there was a difference between. So I'm actually animated both. Um, so we can take a look, but did you guys notice any difference? Oh, geez, there's, uh, there's some issues with the aspect ratios. Um, that's unfortunate. I'm not sure what's going on. Hopefully, 
hopefully I can, I'm not trying to be able to solve that right now, but um, hopefully you could just, uh, you could uh, gather what the information you need from my screen. Um, was it, was there anyone else that was, is everybody having problems with the aspect ratios or are we okay? If not, I can run it on my end. We could just look at it. <laughs> So did anyone notice any differences? So, and Miriam Thomas basically says, yes, it flips the resulting function. Yeah, so, so if we play and that's right. Um, so it does kind of matter, right? It's still the same, um, the same shape, but it is flipped. And it just happens, it just depends on the way you're coming, what direction you're coming from, <laughs> what, um, what sides be. So if you look here, we do get that flip. So it's something to know is that it, it, it does affect um, your, your, the order in which you get this um, autocorrelation result. So something to know. Um, and that's kind of one that I just wanted to show. So yeah, you're right, it, it flips them. So okay. with that, I think that's it for, uh, for- Is everyone taking care of, because I, I have an error as well. Uh... Oh, you know what? There's a typo, so my apologies. There's a, this should be not be box part. I must have not corrected this. So if you switch that um, to sawtooth um, down there instead of box cart, um, that should fix it. So my apologies. <laughs> All right. Did that uh, fix people's errors? Okay, Madison says yes, yes. Okay, great, awesome. wonderful. Sorry about that. All right. All right, any, any questions before we move on? Comments, anything? I'm trying to keep a track of this. Okay. All right, so let's move on to the next topic. And that was, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about convolution again, another really important operator that, that I've already alluded to before. Um, Sorry to interrupt. We, we actually have a quick question about what is an application of using autocorrelation? It's a way of seeing how, it, it basically how a signal can repeat in itself. So like yeah. if you have a long time window and, and you have things that are repeating that signal, you can see that they're, they're repeating. On each yeah. other, so you'll get peaks in the autocorrelation as you move away, so that that's essentially what it it, it could be used for. Um, you know, a lot of times your own eyeball works really well. You don't need the math to show you that. So you know, um, and and I encourage you to. I, I'm an old school seismologist, so I, I like to look at wiggles, and so you know you can see certain things in there. Um, but it's really that the tools that we use to, to do this in a in more automated automated ways and, and even with machine learning and all these different aspects, you, you've got to understand these foundational components. Um, but hopefully that answered your question, um, Taylor. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, so let's go ahead and um, let me start sharing my screen again. All right, so uh, I want to talk, to, I, I'm not going to belabor this because we just don't have the time, but really um, uh, when we're talking about a lot of our signals in seismology, we're talking about really about linear systems. And, you know, there's something called the LTI, which is linear um, um, uh, uh, time invariant system. So they're not changing as a function of time. Now, that's kind of an odd thing to say in seismology because a seismogram changes as a function of time. Okay, but, uh, uh, and that's because you have PS and surface waves that are coming in, it, that signal's being distorted. But seismology is also pretty smart in the sense that, you know, for years they, they've understood that and they understand the frequency of those contents of those signals are different. So we window certain things. And so really um, uh, we, can, we can make anything really in seismology linear and time invariant. And time invariant basically means it's not changing as a function of time. So um, with that in mind, we're going to get to some really an important operator. Now, um, we're going to talk about basically convolution. And if you look at this particular function right here, um, how is that different than what we talked about earlier? Um, how does this look compared to our cross correlation? What is the big difference in it? I'm not going to be able to find it, I bet, but here it is. So look at our cross correlation here. Let me just get rid of this. See that function? We have some sort of output. And then I go to convolution, which is going to be down here. 
Yeah, I got it right. I have my little flags here to help me out. So um, <clears throat> how is that different than this? Besides, it, I have an H there. What's the difference between a cross correlation on a convolution? No, I don't have my. One response is that H is flipped from swapping no. Okay, so what do you mean by flipped? That's a, that is the right answer. Swap nil. That, that, you're exactly right. So H is flipped. And what it, that means is that the indices here, this has been, time, it's been flipped. It's been actually physically flipped. Okay. So let's go back again and compare that. So that's minus K. Um, and basically N here is the same index. You see that time? Go back over here and it's basically, oops, minus K. You see that that, and that little flip right there is, is really important, it turns out. That, that does a, a lot to, it does different things for your multiplication here. And we use the term, the star. This is, remember, I started off with the spy, right? The displacement is a function of source convolved with the propagation convolved with the instrument. So <clears throat> what this is, is a really important operator. This is, this is probably one of the most important operators that we have um, in seismology because it's essentially it's a filter. And we're gonna step through to understand this a little concept a little bit more. It actually has really other really nice properties. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about um, Fourier transforms. And in Fourier transforms, um, basically convolution becomes a multiplication. Um, and, it does, and, and it's really, really quick. Um, uh, and so swap minute basically says, uh, we take H minus K and then shift it in time. That's exactly right. And you're shifting and you're shifting, multiplying, multiplying and, and summing, shifting, multiplying. You're flipping, shifting, multiplying and, and summing. It's really kind of a complex operator. It's, it's fairly easy to understand in, in the time domain. It's even easier in the Fourier domain. It's just a multiplication. And so that's what makes it really, really simple and a really powerful operator for us in seismology. Um, and so let's go ahead and step through um, our exercise. Uh, I think we're, we're great on time, David, so we're, we're doing well. So why don't you go ahead and take over? Let me stop sharing. Okay. So we're gonna move on to the next part here. So the convolution. Um, and you are going to notice, and like Dr. Velasco said, there is a flip. So something to note um, before you even get started. Um, so I'm pushing the signal B. This is the one I'm convolving to signal A. If you look at this, you can notice the pink is flipped. We flipped that signal. And that's, that's what that consequence of that, um, that term that he was talking about, the H term, that you're flipping the signal and then you're moving it across. Besides that, it's almost identical to a correlation. But you do need to flip it before you apply it. Um, so. And again, you're gonna be applying this the same, um, same way, but uh, something before a little uh, a fix, um, this one had the same error. So please go ahead and change this to Sawtooth again. <laughs> so I, I, that, I think it was a, a block signal, I forget what I had it before, but um, change that to Sawtooth here. So, um, cause if not, you'll run into the same error. Um, and I kind of just want you to guys uh, um, calculate this again and, and let me know that the, does direction or does the, does the order of weight, of the signals that we convolve in matter in this case. Um, and you guys can let me know. I'll let you guys play around with that for a little bit. So give him another minute? Yeah, yeah, give him like a minute. I'll give him, how about two? No. Yeah, it, doesn't, it shouldn't take too long. I don't think so. Yeah, one minute. So. <laughs> I'll be right back and get some tea. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. So we'll, we'll wait for um, Dr. Velasco to get back before we.
Okay, minutes up. So what do we have? What's your question? So did the order matter? So Madison basically says it looks like the concavity of the resulting function is reversed. So let's let's take a look, David. Yeah, so let's let's play. So here I have them switched, right? And we're just gonna go ahead and play through the animation. We'll see, we'll see what happens when we come through them. This one's a little bit glitched, but eh, still the same shape, so we should be okay. <laughs> but so actually the order doesn't matter for, and I think what you're referring to is maybe it the concavity kind of switched between the correlation and the convolution. Um, and that kind of that's kind of yeah, you kind of can see that. Yeah, <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So um, but the order between the um yeah, so order doesn't matter. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so yes, compared to the um coral uh, cross correlation, you do see that. Um, concave like kind of switch over um, but yeah order doesn't matter and like um, like Dr. Velasco says uh, we'll get maybe a little bit more into it later but this is applying a filter between these two signals um, so it's a flip then we do the the, uh, the addition and then we sum and then we move it so we kind of repeat that process we go along we get these um, so hopefully everybody kind of got that result and we're able to plot that but you would just again in Python you could just use them um, in this case signal convolve and then your two signals so let me just make a quick comment about that. Um, so when he said order matters, it is really important because if you if you're doing a uh, like for uh, I'm sorry for cross correlation, not for convolution, doesn't matter. You're basically the output of that is essentially a filtered system. Is really you you have two signals, you you've applied it, and it's basically the output of that of that um, of that system, which is basically what we call a convolution, and in fact what we call a filter. Same thing. Okay, that's a, that's it's, it's the same concept. Uh, convolution, the frequency domain is much simpler. Um, and that's why we use it a lot. It's very simple, it's very quick, you know, really, really fast. There's something called the fast Fourier transform that really has been developed in the 60s and we still use today. It's, it's hard to beat. Um, but the cross correlation is actually very interesting because time, you got to keep track of what signals and then what time shifts you need to apply to that. So like, for example, if I'm trying to do this hypo DD or trying to get better, you know, P wave picks and I'm slightly off on one, I have to know what that time shift is. I have to know what that time shift is so that I can correct my picks based on that cross correlation. You know, my manual picks, for example, may be off slightly because of noise and the cross correlation helps me pick those, those, those P waves much more precisely. So that's why you need the order is actually really important. Okay, so you know what am I time shifting? What's that magnitude of the time shift? And so that's where the order becomes really important. So, you know, so again, understanding the details of these operations is really critical. And so we're just giving you a flavor of this today. And I encourage you, like, if if this is something that's critical, you might want to. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, go through, um, um, uh, you know, uh, other, other exercises, other, other things that we're presenting today. So hopefully, again, high level view. So I have a, a, a question from Gabriel, and basically Dr. Aaron, any, by any chance there exists a proof of why it is a convolution of signal signals and not an other operation. I mean, not why correlation is convolution obvious. That's a great question. Now, a, a proof in the mathematical way, I, I don't think I can help you there. Um, it's more like, um, um, and maybe someone else can answer this better than I can, but essentially, um, remember what I said earlier, that the earth acts as a filter. And so uh, we're trying to describe what those filter systems is. And in fact, a sinusogram is a set of linear filters. And I can, I can break down even that source term to be moment tensor times source time function or convolved at source time function times whatever sort of elements. Um, if it's linear, you can basically, linear filters, you can, you can break any signal down. I don't care what it is. It could be the radio, whatever. If it's linear signals, you can break out into a linear set of operations. And that's essentially what, what um, we're dealing with. Um, Jose basically says, I'm, I'm receiving this error name, yeah. uh, boxcar yeah. is not defined. Like I mentioned, you're gonna wanna change this. I, I, like a, earlier, I, I left that same mistake from last time. Um, so this term, um, it probably said boxcar, and you're gonna wanna change that to sawtooth. Um, so if you just copy and paste sawtooth in there. Um, did, did I answer your question, Gabriel? 
Okay, all right. Awesome. Great questions, by the way. So I, I appreciate the engagement. And it's hard for us. I, I shared before we even started live that, you know, that the online is kind of tough for us because um, especially someone like me, I like to, to see, you know, the glazed look or <laughs> students if I don't, if I'm not explaining things right. And that's a very hard to get, right? Uh, when you're when you're online like this. Okay. So go ahead and start your next exercise because I think that actually will help us. Um, okay. So we're going to kind of go into a little bit of a, a little bit more hopefully simplistic um, uh, process that we can do. So we just talked about correlation, convolutions. Those kind of have these complex, like you have to flip it and move it around. Um, so we're going to do something called signal stacking. And this is just really adding two signals together. Um, <clears throat> David, I also want to, I'm going to build on spectra based on what you're, you're going to present. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Right. Just stop me when, whenever you want. Okay. okay. Um, so. In this case, I'm just going to create a couple of cosine waves. And again, we're going to construct them. You can construct them the same way that we did the, the sine waves originally. Um, and I believe you guys have this, so you don't have to create anything. But feel free to play around with the frequencies and the amplitudes and see how the signal changes. Um, but in this case, I, I provide these um, two cosine signals. Um, you can see here, this is where I construct them. And then I'm just adding them. And in this case, I'm just adding them with NumPy add. It's just faster. You could just add them with a plus symbol. Um, but uh, in Python, sometimes it's a little slower. So here, this is where I'm adding them together and you can see the resulting signal. So before we kind of look at that, this I'm just adding these two signals together, right? So, um, and maybe somebody can tell me kind of some of the observations that you can make um, from this. So what, when I add them together, what do you notice? What, it, so maybe you guys can put in the chat, what's, what's kind of shared, what, are, what, is, what is it? What can you say about the signal relative to the previous, to the original ones? Like if you had to describe, like what are, like the, do they share frequencies or the amplitudes the same? Did it adopt some? Or... Yeah, that's right. It would that's uh, two peaks in the frequency spectrum, and we'll get to that. We'll get to that Fourier transform. We'll look at that. Um, it's very important, actually, <laughs> um, and that is true. Um, and you can kind of see that in the time domain here, because um, this is a very simple um, signal. But once it gets more complicated, we, we tend to go into the frequency domain to see that those peaks. Um, but yeah, and the, the general idea is that you're kind of just adopting the, the frequency between the two and those amplitudes, right? So you're going to see like this uh, this low amplitude signal kind of just rides that higher um, and lower lower frequency, higher amplitude signal there to create this, you know, this stacked signal. So that's what this is creating. We'll get into um, a Fourier analysis in a little bit, um, but because this is the Fourier analysis kind of, the, um, kind of builds off of this on, on signal stackings and specifically with sinusoids, um, so sines and cosines. Uh, and can you, uh, any questions? Okay, so let me go ahead, uh, David, and let me, let me, I'm going to build on what you just did right now, and then we're going to go back a little bit uh, yeah, to yeah. the final comments on convolution, um, just really quick. Yeah, yeah. All right, so <clears throat> this is horrible. I was trying to, got it. so basically this is what we just saw right now, right? We saw some sort of summation. We sum these two signals up. And we got something like this, right? So it was something like this. So if we really think about this, we can we can break this down into a sine and cosine at some at some basically um, uh, frequencies, right? We know that the you know we just played with those um, signals before we started this, right? We started a very simple sign, and you're like, oh, oh my god, you know. They're gonna, we're going over sines and cosines. Come on, come on, dude. Okay, so the bottom line is that um, you could tell I'm from LA, by the way. Anyway, uh, the omega naught is is the frequency at which um, you know this is a one signal, and you have an amplitude associated with this a one uh, a naught. Let's just go a naught, and then a a one. I can look at this in a different domain, and I can I can transform this into a domain, and we're gonna we're gonna get there in just a second. We're going to call this the, the frequency domain. And I can, uh, it, if I could say this is the frequency here and this is the amplitude, 
I'm going to use a different color now. I'm going to use a, a blue. Um, where is that going to fall on this sort of plot? Where is omega naught? Is it going to be omega naught? Is it going to be on this side or is it going to be over here? Now I, I realize I can't I ask a question. I can't see the chat. So left or right? <clears throat> relative to one another, relative to omega one. It's going to be the left, exactly. So, and, and I have an amplitude here, right? So it's, I have an amplitude that's actually pretty tall. We'll call this A naught. And I can draw a point right there. And essentially, I have one frequency that's represented in this domain, in this frequency domain. The other one would be a, a higher frequency and lower amplitude. And it's exactly those two peaks that um, Darren had mentioned before. So that Darren is, is, is basically pointing out, well, you're gonna have two peaks in your, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your spectrum. Well, this is called the spectra. And we'll get into this a little more detail mathematically and whatnot um, uh, as, uh, in just a little bit. So th that's why that sort of like, that, that sort of foundational, I know sines and cosines are really the foundation for Fourier transform. It also presents problems and we're gonna talk about that in a second too, uh, what those problems are um, uh, for, for various types of signals. Um, to sort of finalize this concept, and I, and I just wanted to just kind of um, highlight something that, that's really important. We have no time to discuss. We're not gonna cover it, but there's something called difference equations. And that's also a way to a review a filtered system. And in fact, if you apply a filter in MATLAB, for example, you have to use coefficients. And coefficients um, um, are essentially these A's and B's. And there's something called a, a moving average, an MA, uh, and, um, um, and IIRs, all different types of things that, that step way beyond what we'll, 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 we'll want to talk about really today. But I want to point out that difference equations are actually really fundamental too to just signal processing and filtering, to be able to understand those and whatnot. We're not going to cover them today. But we're going to just cover these key concepts. But I, I just wanted to present that as something that's really important. And I also wanted to show some other examples of convolution. And this is this is actually um, um, a uh, a sweep of a signal used for um, like a, a vibra size. And uh, and and this is basically what um, uh, this is the the p. So this is be the the source and the p. And that P in this case is representing sort of like a, a, a re, um, uh, some sort of signals as a function of time. Um, and you see negative and positive. And that there's, there's all those complexities and wave propagation with, with seismology. We're not into that, right? We're just talking about you know, what we can do with signals. So if you actually convolve the two, <clears throat> you can essentially get this really complex looking signal. But really, when you're doing a vibra size, you're just trying to get that point. And the reason why I use different frequencies has to do with attenuation, it has to do with resolution, it has to do with all these different elements. That it's more of a, a wave propagation, a wave equation sort of uh, approach as opposed to signal processing. But I wanted to show you that this could look really complex, but it's really just a convolution with two signals. And then I, then I can cross correlate um, uh, uh, these signals and essentially get the, the P again. And, I, and I'm and getting some really interesting phenomenon here. We're gonna talk a little bit about that where I get some uh, rattling and whatnot. So there, there's some really nice uh, examples of, of what you would get. This is a real world example in many respects of a, of a vibra, vibra size sweep and then uh, an earth response. And the earth response is basically um, uh, reflections and refractions and all those different aspects of the earth as things are bop, uh, you know, bopping around the earth and whatnot. Um, uh, so, uh, so Suzanne asked why cross correlate instead of deconvolve. Um, uh, it, you could, it, it's a function of stability in some respects. Decon deconvolution is a, is a division and division can present problems too. As long as it's well behaved systems, no problem. That's why you would want to use a cross correlation instead of a deconvolution. And deconvolution um, is, is really a, um, uh, so, um, Another process and whatnot, and, and we'll 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 get into it a little bit as we move forward. So, um, what's our next exercise, David? So, I just wanted to cover those particular things really quick. For the analysis, is I'm just going to show one real quick. So, okay. Um, so, um, let's see. Page 
10 has it. So let me just mark that. So we Fourier. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say we can move quickly to the next one if you want. Just let me know. Okay. So I'm not going to belabor this too much. As you can see, all my notes on this. Fourier transfers are really critical for, 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 for what we do. Um, and there's, there's something called Fourier series we're not going to talk about. Let's go ahead and just dive into um, uh, Fourier transforms. Um, and we're going to understand this phenomenon in just a second, by the way. Um, but let me just talk about transforms really quickly. And then um, uh, Fourier, so uh, this is, I always tell my students, this is the equation that you need to put underneath your pillow and understand, okay? This is, this is really the fundamental equation that we're doing. If we really look at, at this particular um, uh, Fourier, this is a Fourier transform. We're transforming from the time domain to the frequency domain, and we're doing it by uh, 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 an integration um, and, a and a multiplication of e to the i omega t, okay? And what is e to the my, uh, uh, omega t is essentially um, cosines and sines. So I keep talking about that. And so Fourier is basically breaking down your signals with the basis functions being sines and cosines. That's what you're trying to do. And so, um, uh, and so that presents, it's, it's really a powerful analysis for us. Remember it has to be, it's, it's linear time invariant. That's, that's a key thing. Um, uh, you can get into complications with that. And it's also in, in the Fourier series, it, it does essentially the same thing. This is just a way, um, we can do this, but let's go ahead and get into the to the next exercises, and we'll explain what I, what I have on on the board in just a second. Let me stop sharing, David. You're on. So we're just going to do a real quick analysis here. So if you run this, um, so if we move on to the next section, the Fourier analysis, I kind of gave you this weird waveform, right? And you might look at that, and that I think something that's powerful about doing this type of analysis is that we can reconstruct these signals using those cosines and sine waves um, to kind of, and then we won't get maybe too much into it, but there's a lot of things you can do with that information. Um, and here I provide that um, time domain, what he was talking about. So this is that waveform. And then we have the frequency domain. You see that this axis down here is frequency. Um, you can see those peaks. Um, and in this case, I'm just plotting it with a line plot, but um, you can just look at the peaks. Don't worry about the slopes in this. Um, and you can see uh, at what um, amplitudes we have signals or these um, sinusoid signals in there embedded. Um, and I kind of have an exercise. I don't know if, if we're running out of time. We can, I can either have them do it or we can, we can move on. Um, well, <laughs> I'll keep going while he's... Uh, so um, here, I just kind of like the idea was to kind of get you guys to just realize this to by adding um, sine waves. So here we can just add a couple of sine waves. Um, and there's a couple of different ways of doing it. I don't know what you guys are familiar with, but you can do a simple loop or you could just add them straight up. Um, so you can construct a couple of sine waves with these, um, with these attributes. So you can see the, um, so here it'd be like a, a frequency of 10 with an amplitude of, I'm sorry, a frequency of 30 with an amplitude of 10. Uh, if you point at that point, it tells you here. So you can use those values to construct a signal and then add these, all these peaks up and see if you can recreate the signal, right? Um, so that's the idea here. Um, if you want, you guys can uh, go ahead and go for that. You can um, write a quick script. Hopefully it's not too complicated um, and just add. So just like a little bit of a hint. So you're gonna have one, two, three, four. So you're gonna have four sign signals that you're gonna add up to recreate it and see if you can, if it plots the same. Um, oh, you're, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. My daughter was asking me a question. Yeah, no worries. Uh, uh, let me just back up just a little bit and uh, explain what that spectra is, the power yeah. spectrum. So go ahead. Let me go ahead and share my screen oh, yeah, real yeah. quick. So we, oops, didn't finish sharing. Okay. So we, we, you hear the term spectra a lot, right? So what is spectra? And so the when you do a Fourier analysis, basically you have a real component and an imaginary component. And so you can represent that in many ways. You can represent it as a real part, an imaginary part. Um, and we, we're not going into complex numbers today. That's, that's just, you know, we, we just don't have time to do that. And hopefully you all have experience with, with complex numbers. Um, 
but we can represent in different ways. And so a lot of times we represent it um, um, as a function of amplitude and phase. That's essentially what those, uh, uh, those components are. So it's basically the, the, the ratio, the, the arc tangent of the ratio of the um, uh, imaginary over the real or the, the um, basically the, the, the scalar, um, um, the square root of the squares, uh, the sum of the squares for the um, real and imaginary part for the amplitude. And so we look at it and, and we're not emphasizing at all phase today. Phase does tell you uh, information. We're not gonna emphasize it. Um, um, it really is, uh, it relates to that time. Remember that time shift? So phase shift relates to time shift. We saw that with our sign signal earlier, um, but just for conceptual, conceptually, we just wanna cover, um, um, uh, we just want to cover um, uh, amplitude spectra. So what, what David is already showing you is essentially, um, oops, I don't know why it drew a curve. That's it. All right, it was essentially um, an amplitude and frequency, which is essentially we're, we're plotting this particular term. And that's what we call the spectra, okay? That's what that's essentially what we're doing. So, so David, you're on again. So let's. Yep. Just, uh, while you're talking about the spectrum, you have a question saying that the Fourier spectrum plot ends at 500 hertz, and so does that mean that the sampling rate is 1,000 hertz? Um. So the sampling rate is actually uh, 500 in this. Uh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? I'm not sure. So because of Nyquist, uh, right? That's it. Yeah. Referring to the Fourier spectrum plot, the question is. The Fourier spectrum plot ends at 500 hertz. Does that mean that the signal sampling rate is 1,000 hertz? So, mm. what 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 you say? Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, and and in fact, uh, remember what the Nyquist is. The Nyquist is 250. So in his plots here, he should be plotting just a 250. That's yeah. really what, what's really important. And so the, again, you know, we, we kind of ignored it. Um, and that's fine, but you bring out a great point. The Nyquist is 250. And so he just corrected yeah, that yeah. plot. Yeah, so yeah, we don't want to look from 250 <laughs> to 500 on that signal. The yeah. great question, great observation. That's yeah, awesome. No, that's a good point. Yeah, you don't want to, you get in trouble. That goes into the aliasing problems that we, were, we started with um, if you go too high. So yeah, that's right. So it's 500. So we, we really want to stick within the 250. That's just a plotting issue <laughs> on my end. Um, but uh, so if you look at this, again, we can look at this and, and I can kind of get you guys started. So um, again, um, you can just reconstruct this signal um, up here by looking at the information here um, using a, a Fourier um, series of signs. In this case, we're just gonna use signs. Um, uh, so you can start with just a zero vector um, or array, and then we can just start adding. Um, so here, notice that I had like for the first signal, I have an amplitude of 10. That's grabbed from here, and it's at a frequency 30, so 30 hertz. So I just put 30, and then I add it to the next one. And then the next signal, amplitude of one, um, frequency of 40. And you can kind of go build upon that. And let me know if you actually are able to reconstruct that signal here once you add those four um, signs. So maybe we could give people a, a little bit of time to, to see if they can reconstruct it. Let me know. You want another minute? see how people are doing, yeah. So it looks like somebody was able to do it, cool. So hopefully, hopefully people are able to construct that. It kind of starts. One question asking, how do you know to use sine versus cosine? Um, well, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you can look at the formula too, it's specific. In this case, I just ended up using sine, but um, the cosine and sine, you could use either one. There's just a phase shift component to it. So you can kind of get away with using either one as long as you account for that phase shift because um, those, those signals are, are virtually digitally identical in that sense. Awesome, so we got people that said they reconstructed it um, uh, correctly. So awesome, it's awesome, cool. Um, just put the answer here so I can just run it. Hopefully, it'll plot. 
Awesome. And that's right. So we're able, that's something that's really powerful about this, right? Because if I were to just give you this signal, I think it'd be really hard for you guys to tell me what the frequencies are just by looking at it, right? You can't really read the frequency content on this to easily reconstruct the signal. But once we go into this domain, the frequency domain, we look at the spectra, we can actually, you know, get this information that's really important for uh, being able to understand what, the, what signals exist inside our, our waveforms and then to even to be able to reconstruct them. And, and yeah, sure enough, when I add them up, this looks identical to this signal up here. So great job. David, could you plant that um, that spectra? A lot of times we view it as a um, log log. Yeah, could yeah. Could you plant that in a log log plot just really quickly? Uh, oh, you know what? I can't do it. <laughs> I don't have access because this is a custom function I had. I have to go a little bit deeper into the code. Oh, okay. we'll, we'll look at, well, yeah, I probably should have. We'll look into it in a little bit later. We'll use some real data and we'll, we'll, now, we'll plot it in log log because that is the okay. seismology. So. Yes, and there's a reason for that. So um, uh, that's the, the important thing here is that to realize that, you know, th that's a linear linear plot. Mm -hmm. And most times we use log log. And uh, you'll see th there's, it compresses sort of the, the signal. You have multiple um, uh, uh, different um, decades, if you will, that allow you to see the uh, uh, a little more, um, it compresses sort of the, the frequency um, that you're looking at it, it's just it's a standard way that we we use this and we'll get into that when we start to talk about real data but why don't you go ahead david and it, you you have also um something about gibbs and let's yeah. just go ahead and step through that okay so um something to consider um so in this case we were able to reconstruct the signal pretty well there was no real weird anomalies or any noise that was added into it once we were when we, we reconstructed it using the sign um signals right um but something interesting happens when you have these sharp corners or these sharp abrupt changes in the signals um, when we start reconstructing it with sine waves. Because um, you can still, re we try to represent this using uh, that Fourier series and we're gonna kind of just show this real quick. Um, so here we have a step function and you notice that these the sharp changes in amplitude basically um, throughout the signal. And we're gonna try to reconstruct this. So up here, I have a couple of, um, you know, of inputs that I want you guys to try out. So go ahead and go through these sequences and see what it plots. See, see if there's anything, if there's any issues with re recreating the signal once we use just these sine waves. And all this function is doing, um, and you can look into the math, we won't get into it, but it's, it's, it's using signs, you know, and cosines to reconstruct this, um, this signal up here. It's doing the same thing we basically did up here, but it's automated. So, because uh, the math is a little bit more complicated, we're not gonna get into it, but um, so go ahead and play around with this, you know, go through these, these um, these number of sinusoids that we're going to be adding up to and see what, what outputs we get. So another minute? Yeah, yeah, another minute. So as soon as you guys are able to go through them, let me know if you see any anomalies or anything weird compared to the original signal or the signal we're trying to reconstruct. Is it a perfect reconstruction in this case? Okay, cool. Yeah, so we have some um, Kevin saying not perfect, but it gets better as sinusoids increase. Okay, yeah. Um, there's spikes near the edges. That's it. That's something that's that's something we're going to look at and talk about in a little bit. So yeah, it's correct. Um, so when the signal count increases. Yeah, so and does the spike seem to get disappear? Does the amplitude change between the spike? What, what do we what do we notice about that spike just before I kind of kind of wrap it up here? Yep, this is my timer. Oh. So I guess we're going to just show you very quickly. So, <laughs> well, actually, let's get a response here. I like your, your question. So, yeah. So the repeat your question. So yeah. is there any difference between the spikes at those at those corner edges? Does, does the amplitude, does it, are we able to, does it look like it gets better as we increase the, um, the number of sinusoids that we're adding up or does the amplitude stay kind of the same? And I'll kind of just start plotting them out while you guys um, uh, look at those and consider that. Why don't you go ahead and put a, your own, like a, put a thousand in there, David, see what happens. <laughs> see. So we see here, right? It's that, that spike there. 
So what David is illustrating is something we call Gibbs phenomena. And that Gibbs phenomena is something that, in other words, you can never, um, sines and cosines, the way to think about it, sines and cosines don't represent discontinuities. You cannot represent a discontinuity with that. And so you're never going to match the signal perfectly. In fact, there's, there's something called the overshoot, and it's about a 9% um, uh, overshoot, actually, if you, if you sum up the amplitude and energy. And it doesn't matter how many sinusoids you use, you can never represent that sort of a discontinuity in uh, using sines and cosines as a basis function. Now, there's another transform. They're not the Fourier, but there's there's something called wavelets, and with a wavelet you can represent discontinuities, um, and you can match that perfectly, um, and then you use um, and it's based on what we call scales. Not covering that today. That's another element of, of signal processing, but it's just something that to realize that whenever you have a discontinuity in the signal and you're using filters that are essentially that based on Fourier, you're going to have issues, and you might actually see spikes in your signals. When you have dropouts and you have sort of a dropout in zero, you're going to see those spikes at the end of your uh, your signals. And in fact, they could dominate um, when you're doing a filter on real data that you haven't. And we're not going to talk about this today, but you haven't, um, you know, removed the mean of a sizogram. You haven't tapered the ed, uh, the edges. You need to do those functions, or else you will get something uh, similar to this, where you 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 essentially get spikes in your data. Yes, yeah, so Fourier is, is, is an infinite series, but you wouldn't you. Uh, uh, but the fact that you're using this is a great question. So Madison asks, isn't Fourier series an infinite series? Uh, wouldn't that be able to construct a discontinuity? And the answer is no, cannot do it. Um, so I think it, I, it's a continuous function, and you have a discontinuity. You cannot do that. Go ahead, so, David. Something I'd like to add. You need to be careful too, because um, maybe you notice if you put a really big number for this here. Um, you will see them disappear, but that's not a function of the math. That's a limitation in the sampling rate of the signal. So if we go too ridiculous mm -hmm. here, um, we start aliasing that signal, and it looks like we solved the issue, but we didn't. Um, the math doesn't actually add up, and if we were to actually sample it appropriately, um, you'll still get those spikes. So even though you have an infinite, as long as you're, you're keeping track, oh man, how, how much... You see how big I need to make this to make it disappear. Hopefully it doesn't crash my notebook. But if you do go big, large enough, you do those um those those that gift phenomenon gets at the frequency content that's in there kind of disappears because of the aliasing. So uh, you got to be careful with that. So don't just assume that because you ran enough um, you know uh, additions of signs in the at least in your code that it actually got rid of that that error because it, it hasn't. It's still there. And it looks like it's taking a little bit too long to run. Maybe I added a little bit too many zeros there, but um. But yeah, you just have to be careful with that. But like um, Dr. Velasco said, it, it won't disappear. You can't account for those discontinuities, even if even if your results look like they did. Okay, so now we spent the, an hour and a half just setting the foundation. We, we need to understand what we're going to do with this information, and that is the other, of course, um, thing that we want to do is apply filters, um, and that, that's essentially uh, what we're, we're getting to. So, let me go ahead, David, and share. We'll, we'll start with a little a mini lecture here. <clears throat> and essentially what we want to do is, is to, um, you know, uh, look, look our uh, signal. This is actually not, not, it's a filter, but this is actually de deconvolution, by the way. Um, and this, this shows you what can happen uh, when you do frequency domain division and how you can get different sort of aspects of you removing the instrument, but essentially what you're doing is removing a filter and you can do this and create some really big problems. So this would be our original sort of seismograms. Um, uh, and you can see you have big spikes here and that's because um, uh, you're dividing close to zero, um, way beyond the scope of what we wanna talk about today. But uh, the bottom line is that um, uh, we can apply different types of filters. And so, <clears throat> Um, as I mentioned before, and I didn't get into the properties of Fourier, but Fourier is essentially a frequency domain multiplication. Okay, so I can uh, uh, apply um, uh, 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 two signal. I can transform them. Um, basically, um, uh, uh, multiply them in in the Fourier domain, and essentially transform them back into the time domain, and we get um, a um, 
a signal. So I, 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 thought, I see someone raised a hand. I just saw it pop up to the chat. Was there someone that raised a hand that wanted to say something? Yeah, I, I, I see that icon. Uh, me, I'm sure I can see who it was, but please feel free to post your question in the chat. All right, so I see it's uh, Jao. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you chat, if you if it's there, you can you can feel free to let me know. But essentially, what we want to do is that there's um, what we call ideal filters, and ideal filters um, would be like a a low pass, high pass, band pass, and a band stop. And that's essentially what we're talking uh, when we talk about filters. And and so. What this is, this is again, frequency domain. This is positive frequency, this is negative frequency. And that, that's kind of an odd concept, like why would you do that? Well, remember that, that our, our um, Fourier transform is really, it's not one-sided, it's two-sided and it's negative infinity to infinity of minus omega t uh, d t. Okay, so that's essentially what our Fourier transform is. And remember, I said that, that that's an important equation. You can ha have something else that that's you know in your in your, in your in your pocket is understanding that Fourier is basically sines and cosines, and this is the basic the basic formula. And so, <clears throat> really, uh, if we just focus on the, the positive frequencies, let's just do that. There we go. So we're just focusing on this aspect. So a, a low pass would be I'm removing all the high frequency energy. A high pass, I'm removing the low pass. Um, this would be some sort of band pass where um, I'm allowing only certain frequencies. And then a band stop or a notch. This is sometimes called a notch filter. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm basically um, getting rid of some frequency centered around something. Now, remember, this is, I say, ideal. And the reason why it's ideal is because, remember, uh, I said, whenever you have discontinuities, you enter problems, right? So if I were to actually input this in into any sort of filter, um, transform it, and have that, I would introduce um, uh, effects that I don't want, um, essentially, um, because that's essentially what we're doing. We're, we're, we're distorting the signal. And remember, you know, we have amplitude and phase, and there's there's all different types of things that, that come into to, to, to play here. There's you know group delays of the filter, which means that you're you're modifying the phase. And then there's something that you hear about a lot. We cannot talk about it, and that's poles and zeros. And that's the way we break down filters as a function of poles and zeros. And we can we can uh, have some principles of how we do that. I didn't talk about that at all. But essentially, that's that's what these forms are. These are poles and zeros, the complex plane, and you design filters based on the the location of those poles and zeros. Again, way beyond the scope. This is really getting into the nitty and gritty of how you filter seismograms and whatnot. And we won't get into that just yet. And of course, I had mentioned before about um, uh, you know difference equations. And you know, there's there's causal furrow filters that are essentially one side of the uh, uh, of the equation. Then then there's what we call moving average sort of filters, all different types of filters. Um, infinite. There's there's um, uh, so many ways to parameterize filters. Um, and I, I again beyond the scope. So um, but I encourage you if this this topic interests you, go ahead and and, and take a. Um, um, a, a digital signal processing course full time, and you can see all the different elements of what we want. So, we're going to spend our remaining time actually looking at some signals, though, and how we would filter those those um, data, what they would look like, how would they look at in the spectra, and how we we interpret those particular signals. And I think, and then that that'll conclude today. But I just wanted to introduce these things that, you know, we didn't talk about poles and zeros, we didn't talk about difference equations. And those are all elements of digital signal processes and that are essentially really critically important as we move forward um, in, your, in your career. And if you need to know that, um, uh, again, you know, take, your, uh, take a, a really full-blown course. Um, I'm teaching one next semester, but it's, uh, you know, I'm teaching at my university and it, it's something that, in fact, I would argue that, that David's dissertation, which we didn't talk about, 
is centered on, on digital signal processing and what you can do um, with different types of signals and, and whatnot. So let me stop sharing, David. Um, and then you go ahead and let's take us home to the, to the filtering. Sounds components. good. Okay. Um, just a few, a few uh, maintenance things that we got to address here because uh, more mistakes on my part. So apologies, but um, so I don't, should, should we just look at the, do you want to look at both waveforms or do you want to look at the yeah, let's look at this one just we have time we have so, time um so for here you're going to want to add space copy because when i uploaded it apparently or when i sent it off i accidentally sent it a copy or it was named copy so um just something to note um i think in the actual notebook it just says wavelet one dot sac um so go ahead and add a space copy in there um so it'll read properly um, and then you should be able to see this. And this is just an example of us reading a SAC file and we're not gonna get too much into that, but um, it's a format in which we save waveform files in seismology. Um, so a lot of times, if you guys are familiar with, and I'm sure a lot of you are, a lot of you seem to be a PhDs and masters, I'm sure you do research in this um, and I don't have to <laughs> tell you about it, but um, you can, you know, it contains these information about like earthquakes and other vibrations that we report at these seismic stations. And this is how we can use, um, OpSpy to read it. I'm not going to get too much into it, but um, it's a very powerful package in Python, and I strongly recommend that you check it out if you decide to really go deep into the uh, DSP seismology side of things. That's a very convenient uh, package to use. So here we use OpSpy to read the file, um, and then we can just extract the data. These are the amplitudes. Um, so, so this is an, uh, an array of the amplitudes, and then we have the date time um, samples. So that's like at which at what time did that sample was that sample taken? Um, so we have those two and we can just plot that. And that's what this is plotting here. So this is that time domain representation of that signal. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, and again, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask me. Um, and then here, so, so next we're gonna plot that spectrum. And here there's another correction I need to make. I believe um, in like uh, Dr. Velasco was saying, we normally plot this in logs. So I think it was like this, you need to add a log because I just forgot to include it there. So you put a comma and then type and then you know quotation marks log. So it'll plot properly here. So you'll notice that it's in the log scales for the Bose axi. axi. Um, so once you plot this, you can kind of see that, um, that frequency content of that, that wavelet or that signal that I kind of just uh, just created for this exercise here. So David, so yeah. um, could you just point out, so you, you have a peak between, what's the peak at? So here, this is between, uh, this is around 3.3 Hertz. Okay, so if you go up, up to like, your wavelet. Oh, signal, yeah. So the time between different peaks, there would be about 0.3 seconds, right? Yeah. So if you, if you did that, essentially you could basically, you're, you're kind of transferring, you know, the, the time domain into the frequency domain. You can see with the, the if you put your, your, your cursor at the peaks, and what the time is? Uh, so this would be, so 13, 18, 45. Oh, well, geez, these are milliseconds. So um, let's see, 45, what's the milliseconds? 633, 783. So, so that's, that's the 0.3, right? Yeah, yeah. That's right, wrong. so that, that's the dominant frequency. So, so you could see that that's, that's the dominant frequency of that particular signal. And that, I just wanted to point that out so you're, in, in you know, the, the, I, I'm doing a little of the math in my head, but it's basically is the bottom line is that the, that's what the figures doing. And, and if you build an intuition, this is the thing I try to emphasize with students is that you build that intuition. You can see that the, 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 then you can trust what you're doing because now you know it's correct. And so if you just do a little bit by hand and eye, eyeballing things, you can say, okay, yeah, that's exactly what I should be getting. Yeah, no, that's a good point. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, kind of just moving along. So we have the spectrum and something we can, and we didn't get too much into this, so, but- So that's the amplitude spectrum, right? We're yeah, not amplitude. plotting the phase. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, so something we can do, we often use in seismology and here you probably want to change it to something like 0.2. I was originally testing this. So, um, so that window, is, uh, I mean, hopefully I don't butcher the explanation for this. So, so that's that time window because we have to look at things uh, within a given window to see the content of it. If we want, if we want, <laughs> if we want some kind of time resolution in the frequency domain, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> um, and uh, Dr. Velasco maybe can explain it a little better if I butcher this. But um, so if we look, take a window and let's say um, here it's 
Um, this is in seconds, so 0 0.2 seconds. So, uh, you know, so it's a small a frag, a fragment. We kind of look at a small window and we take, we kind of calculate the, the, uh, the frequency domain content of the, like what, what frequencies are really popping. Um, and this is really what, this is really a 3D plot. Um, so the way to read this is we have a frequency um, axis. So this is the frequency content and then we have time. So this is at what time did this, this, um, the spec, uh, how would I say this, uh, the spectral content appear. Um, and then we have this color, right? And this color is kind of that Z axis is looking at. So um, warmer colors in this case indicate a higher amplitude. So we can kind of see at where higher, like, where certain frequencies occur at what amplitudes. And this is kind of relative. Um, something to note here, we're not gonna get too much into it, but this is in decibels. Um, it just makes it a little bit easier to plot in spectrograms, um, but, but again, I'm not gonna get too much into it, but the decibels for the amplitude, something to know. Um, so but here you can kind of see- oh, Can I just like, so yeah. if I take any time slot, right? Vertical time slot, right? So I take a turn, what I'm doing is I'm really seeing the, the spectra at that yes. particular time, the, the 2D spectra that you have above, yep. Yeah. So what that spectra is above is over the whole signal. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is that you're stepping as a function of time. Um, uh, for that signal. So you're really mapping 2D um, spectra as a function of time. That's what the spectrogram is. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, this is a sliver. It, I mean, this is for the whole thing, but the way to think about it, this is a sliver of the spectrogram. That's, that is the right way to think about it, yeah. So, um, so again, you can kind of read this. And again, you can kind of get information if you're curious about what amplitudes and what frequencies are dominating your signal. You can see it here. Uh, here we can see like, maybe given this, the windows that we see, maybe between, I don't know, five Hertz, um, there seems to be like a dominant high amplitude stuff around It's here. really three Hertz, right? So it's oh, sorry, about yeah. three Hertz, right? So yeah. that's what your, what your spectra up there was telling you, right? Yeah, it is, um, and, then, I, and something to note again, this is windows. So that three Hertz was captured in that. I think it's, a, it's probably between one and five Hertz um, windows. Mm -hmm. So it's captured in there. So it's something to know about resolution when you do these spectrograms. If, you know, you kind of need to adjust those windows appropriately to really get the, the details that you need from them. Um, so uh, I don't know if there's anything else. Like uh, lastly, I'm gonna, and then we can kind of go back real quickly on, on an actual earthquake. Um, but lastly, we can apply those filters. And in this case, I'm just gonna apply a Butterworth filter. I'm not gonna get too deep into it. Um, and again, there's a lot of information. If, and I, I, like Dr. Velasco says, if you wanna learn more, I highly advise you take a course in it. It's great. And like he says, I've used it a bunch in my dissertation has helped me understand seismology and, and completely it's a it's changed my research and it makes a life a lot easier when you understand the, the nature of your signals um but anyways uh so here David, we have before you do that can um let me just share my screen what a oh, yeah. really is just really quick and yes then, yes no, and then we'll just for kicks um so Butterworth is essentially, remember that I said the ideal filter would be, an ideal filter would be something uh, like this, you know, and then, oops, that's not correct, something like that. But a Butterworth is actually something um, uh, that has a smooth sort of uh, ability and that smoothness decreases, um, I mean, it, it's still smooth, but you're, you know, depending on, you're still living some frequencies through that you may not want. And so the higher order, and it has to do with that infinite uh, series, if you will, um, the higher the order, the sharper the filter. And that's just what a Butterworth represents. Um, and, and there's different shapes and different things. There's different types of windows that you would might use. Butterworth is a standard one that we use, but essentially that's what it looks like in the time domain. And I mean, the frequency domain, and that's what you're applying as you move forward. So, all right, David, yeah, keep no. going. Yeah, no, so yeah, that's exactly right though. That's, so that's what a Butterworth, I'm actually happy he showed it because I don't have a plot of that. <laughs> so what that looks like in the frequency domain, but, um, but yeah, it has that smooth tapering. Um, and here we're gonna apply a high pass, which is, um, which I think is the opposite of what he had, uh, what he was showing. So he had it kind of shown there. Um, you kind of low pass. The, yeah, the low pass. So um, here we're gonna be trying to keep, you know, those, um, those higher um, frequency content relative to, to the signal. Um, so here I have um, five, this is just gonna be that cutoff point. So that kind of where that bend occurs in the frequency. So that's five Hertz in this case. So I'm gonna save things that are five Hertz or higher um, in this case. And then when you plot that, you see that here. So here's that original signal. And then you can kind of see, it didn't change too much, but 
we, you know, we save a, that, that higher Hertz stuff. And I, and I can, you know, you can play around with this and you can change it. Um, we talked about three Hertz and then you can see that signal. So when I change it to, when I save that three, you see, we kind of saved the bulk of that because that was the dominant, um, you know, signal there. Um, but uh, I think with that, I can, I'm going to try, I'm going to cross my fingers that it, it doesn't crash my notebook because, um, and we can look at some real data, some earthquake data. Um, so in hope, I believe you guys have a copy of this, but um, be careful because it, it uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook has its limitations and can be really RAM hungry. So um, it, might, uh, it might not like it that you run this. So, um, so hopefully, hopefully it works properly, but you can kind of, and I think I have that as a comment, you can just paste it there and we can just run it. Hopefully it doesn't take too long to plot. Um, and this is um, the Denali earthquake um, uh, as recorded at a station in Utah. So Denali 2011, I believe it's a 7.9 earthquake. I um, mean, this is just a small segment. I have to cut it down because, um, again, I am limited in the, 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 the RAM usage to, since I'm using a Jupyter, but if you're just using straight up Python, you can get away with using much bigger data sets. Um, but here we have this, again, this uh, waveform that represents that earthquake coming through a station in Utah. Um, and, you know, it just looks like a regular earthquake, but there's something hidden in here. And I think that's where, where the, a lot of these processes really come into play. Um, and you can start doing really interesting analyses for this. So we go ahead and run this and we can look at this content. And again, it looks a little bit different. Ruben, make it log log. Um, let me just wait, uh, uh, Gabriel asks, you know, it seems that we'd always want a higher order Butterworth filter because of the sharp transition. When is it useful to low order? Um, it has to do with computation. Remember we're talking about, um, um, uh, let's say if you have one of these seismograms and you have a very high order filter, it, it could really slow you down. So it's really important that you, you know, again, it's a, it's a balance. Um, I, you know, you also have to figure that, you know, what's my, what's the trade-off here? Um, you know, having a, a, some of the higher frequencies um, come through isn't a horrible thing because you, you've already, you know, tapered them out. So it's not, it's not a, a bad thing. Again, it's understanding that, you know, yeah, you might have some, but you're not gonna have a lot. So you can actually use a pretty low order filter and, and get away um, uh, uh, with a you know, good, solid low pass filter or high pass filter uh, and whatnot. A great question. Yep. So if we um, kind of continue on, so you can kind of see the power spectrum here again. But if, I think what's really interesting when we look at the spectrogram, so if you change this to 10 seconds, because it's a, it's a little bit more appropriate, this is a little bit longer data set we look at the time here compared to that wavelet that we had before. Um, we can plot that again, hopefully awesome. So it didn't crush it. <laughs> so, um, uh, so we can kind of see here and we can start getting an idea of where maybe we want to cut some information off. So here, for the most part, we have the, the that earthquake. And let's say we want to remove the earthquake, but we're interested about the signals that are kind of hidden, you know, behind, like inside that signal. Um, if we look here, the amp, the, this frequency content seems to kind of stretch the entirety there. And that's around... Uh, probably three, five hertz, four hertz, maybe around there. So if we chop, if we remove that stuff, that that low frequency stuff, at maybe let's say five hertz, we'll be left with the signals that produce this up here, and there might be something hidden there. And if we look at it again, we don't really see anything too interesting there. But if we apply that, so here, David, let's go back to your um, spectrogram, yeah. your yeah. one D, uh, not the spectrogram, the spectra. Oh yeah, right there. So your power spectrum. So what you're saying is that. Um, you get, you're getting a dominant energy in that seismogram below really two Hertz, right? Yeah, so yeah, two yeah. Two Hertz and below. Yeah. And that is because of that surface wave. That's the, that's the monster in that seismogram. So if I wanted to analyze different phases, I, would, I, I could window um, uh, these seismograms. And I, if I want to look at the body waves, I have to window those body waves because I, the surface wave is so dominant in this particular case. And in fact, this earthquake generated really strong um, surface waves um, because of directivity effects and because of the, the focal mechanism itself and the source time function as it, as it ruptured down towards the lower 48 in, in Utah. And so that's, that, that's the big thing. So again, it's context, right? Understanding what the signal is, what, what, what that full um, spectra would give you. This is the, the whole seismogram, but it's completely dominated by the surface wave. Then let's go ahead and see what else is in there. Yeah, and we can see there's stuff here. So this is the stuff that maybe we want to look at this higher 
Um, so if we go ahead and apply a, this, we'll apply the same filter here. So we'll apply a, a it'll be a cutoff at five hertz, and we'll keep things that are higher than that uh, in the frequency content. So if we apply, we plot that. Hopefully, fingers crossed, doesn't crash. <laughs> um, so this might take a little bit of time to calculate. It's a little bit intensive for for, for the notebook. But we're going to start. We're going to reveal some signals here. Okay, here we go. So here, and I kind of cut this one off, but um, so yeah, we have the raw signal and something to know is this is scaled. So the, and I should have probably put the, the axes, I should have labeled them, but the, the one on the right is for the filtered signal and the one on the left is for the, the earthquake. And isn't the like millions for the amplitude. So the, the, earth, the earthquake itself coming through is really high amplitude. So it really does a, a good job of hiding these higher frequency signals just because the amplitude content isn't as high. And we saw that here. That's what that monster is here, right? So there's really high amplitude stuff there that's hiding it. If we look here and we take a closer look at one of these signals, we see that this is actually, um, if you guys, I don't know, maybe you guys know what this is, but it's probably another, another event occurring within that waveform. Um, and this is how we actually uh, do types of analysis where like um, things in triggering earthquakes. So when an earthquake causes another earthquake as it comes through dynamic triggering, um, and we can really explore the waveform because again, if we look at just that, um, <laughs> that signal, it's really hard to see because those amplitudes are so extreme here um, that you can't see that, um, that, or that signal hiding and really writing that, um, that waveform in the background. Um, and we can take a closer look at all these, but again, it reveals these other earthquakes in the background. So I don't know if there's anything else you would like to add, Dr. Vosco, but kind of it for me. So <laughs> No, I, I think um, we've got 10 minutes left and, and, and I, I just wanna ask, are there anything else? Actually, um, if you look at this closely, David, and yeah. I just wanna point the, a couple of things out. So can you blow that up? Which one here? This yeah, one so this is, this is where like looking at data is really interesting. So there's a couple of phenomena in here that you can already see. One of them is uh, what people have called tremor. Um, and that's that pulsating energy that, that David is pointing out right there. And the other one is actually an earthquake. Now, and then there's another earthquake, and then there's another earthquake <laughs> as you keep going on. So what, what this, this, this um, uh, and then there's another earthquake, there's another earthquake, and you just keep going on in the earthquake. So really what this earthquake did um, was, was create a huge signal um, uh, that, that propagated through and basically created an aftershock sequence within Utah. It's really, really one of these rare events. And, and you can see this beautiful seismogram. And the fact that we carry, you know, what I didn't mention was what modern seismology really affords that we just, when I came on board um, many years ago, we, mo uh, modern sort of broadband seismology was just in its infancy. And so um, uh, what this is highlighting is that a seismogram or a broadband um, instrument or that eye, which we didn't talk about at all today, um, is really um, something that records over broad ranges of frequencies. Um, and so um, uh, I, I just wanna point that out. And so as we move forward, as you move forward in your career, realize that, you know, that a seismogram contains a ton of information. It, you know, and it just depends on what frequencies you choose to look at and whatnot. Um, uh, and, and, and to sort of go full circle, David's um, uh, dissertation is on, and once you explain what your dissertation's on. And before I, before I move on, uh, Madison asked a question, what are your go-to textbooks and their online research for D learning DSP? That's a fantastic question. Um, I haven't found, I, I, when I teach DSP, I, I, I like to, to have the applications. And so um, there's a, there was a, a series of books that came out that had to do uh, DSP with MATLAB. And um, I, I've built a lot of my courses based on that. The book itself is, is was it's an engineering book. And so, so sometimes what you see are these DSP books that are heavily engineering and they don't necessarily relate to seismology. And so I have yet to find something that's really um, that good. Um, um, and so, um, you know, 
and you know my notes certainly aren't worth beans you know if you wanted to understand something as far as you know um, it's very um, rudimentary if you will so you know this is why i keep pushing that that you know like taking a course is really good because um you can get sort of that um from engineering to seismology sort of thing and and um uh and whatnot that's a horrible answer like but there are um, there are resources out there um, that um, again main they're mainly for engineers and so um, uh, you just have to keep that in mind when you're when you're looking for resources such as this. I I've developed my notes over the years and and um, uh, you know I pull from all those different sources. But the one book I always use just for my class has to do with more of the applications part, and then I fill up with some of the theory as we move forward. Um, hopefully that. That answers your question. Yeah, there's 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 some books like he said. Uh, if you want something a little bit more Python specific, I haven't looked at it too extensively, but I remember looking through it a little bit. And I thought it was pretty good, at least from first glance. As some as um Python for signal processing is a is a good one. I think if you want to stay within the Python um, realm, but again, it, it is not a uh, seismology focused like Dr. Velasco said. It's very much a, a lot a lot of the examples tend to be that more engineering side of things, but yeah good question though too <laughs> yeah all right so david why don't you go ahead and describe i didn't have you present anything but oh yeah <laughs> um so uh so for my dissertation um so i'm more of a uh, more of a forensic seismologist um so i tend to look at signals and try to um, characterize or identify them and they're not necessarily earthquakes i do a little bit of earthquakes i do detection so one of my Actually, two of my chapters relate to this type of analysis. This actually comes directly from one of my one of my data sets. Um, so I'm looking at earthquakes um, hidden inside these other earthquakes as these waveforms from these large magnitude earthquakes come by and trigger um, the faults that are that are near rupture, close critical and close to rupture in a region. Um, I looked at Utah and then I kind of co-authored a paper with um, in Oklahoma. Um, then my other projects are a little bit more exotic. Um, so my uh, my first proper chapter is um, relates uh, at monitoring a nuclear reactor in Oak Ridge National Labs. So we, we were monitoring operations that occur at the nuclear reactor to see if we can identify them just using seismology, just vibrations from the ground. And again, um, DSP key for that type of analysis because the frequency is very important. Um, the fans that rotate once they went to cool that nuclear reactor rotate at a certain frequency. And we can, if we isolate those, we're able to detect those fans. Um, there's water movement, things like that. So that's that's one of them. Um, my other chapter relates in, to COVID. So um, I did a and it, it, uh, so for the nuclear reactor one and the COVID, those are both published. Um, and if you're interested in looking for them, um, you could you could just Google scholarly my name. Thankfully, I have a very rare last name. So if you put uh, David Guanaga um, in uh, Google scholarly, you'll find those two papers and you can read up on them. Uh, but my second paper on COVID, um, I really was monitoring schools to see if we can detect a, size, a change in seismic energy. It's basically anthropogenic activity using just, again, the vibrations, because um, some of the universities actually have seismometers, like, like the one I attend, like um, Aaron's uh, seismometer kid here at UTEP, um, is really close to campus. So we were actually able to show that we can detect that lack of activity of people um, going to school after those school lockdowns due to COVID. Um, and again, DSP is super key for that. We used um, I won't get too much into detail, but again, we look at the frequency content, we play around with the time and frequency domain to kind of do those analysis for that. Um, and lastly, my last chapter, and, and that's, this is more of a work in progress, I'd probably finish later on, but um, um, it's a really expansive, really huge data set. I'm looking at, um, at Japan, um, and I have about, uh, to put it in a context, I have, I want to say 300 terabytes plus worth of data or something like that. It's a really big data set. It's really hard and <laughs> to work with. I think one component is just 100 terabytes, something like that. So um, Japan, as you might know, has a lot of seismicity there. So they have a lot of stations there. They, um, I'm working with 797 seismic stations. So a bunch of data. And again, um, something to note, it's a little bit outside the scope of this, um, what we've shown you today, but like convolutions, super powerful. Um, you can actually, um, maybe, maybe I'm sure a lot of you have used like for loops to do con um, conduct certain analysis or certain processes in Python. Um, for loops can be very slow, very problematic when you're working with a data set that big. You can actually substitute them for convolutions. Um, and, I, and again, I won't get into that, but you can do it because convolutions are so much faster when you calculate them, especially if you use like 
um, you know, th those tricks that we kind of showed you. And again, um, I'm not going to talk too much into that, but um, DSP really has a broad ap application. If, if you have any type of continuous data set, you can apply DSP to. It doesn't have to be just seismology. Um, and for that project, I'm looking at Japan, all this data for this one year, and we're just looking at ambient noise there. We're just trying to figure out what is the, what is the background seismicity telling us for that project. So again, applying the same types of uh, methods that, are, that we showed you today, um, and we're looking at the frequency content, we're playing around with those waveforms, we're trying to identify these signals to see what, we, what that data tells us about that region. Um, so that kind of that sums up my, my dissertation. Uh, and if you have any questions, of course, I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> There's a couple of questions. questions. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so uh, Gab uh, Gabriel basically says, Dr. Aaron, so eventually should we evolve to wavelet analysis too? It seems powerful. It is very powerful. But see, we're, we're seismologists in, 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 have been really smart if you really think about it. Remember I said that you know, normally you would not take a spectrum of a full seismogram because we know that the frequency characteristics change as a function of time. And so we window. And we do the analysis based on that. That's perfectly fine. The wavelet, I don't have to window because I, I, I'm, you know, it, it, the whole I, thing is that I can identify different transit signals and get better actually time resolution. It just depends on the application. And so when I got first introduced it in the early '90s, I thought, boy, this is a, the greatest thing ever. And you know, we'll get rid of FOIA eventually, but it, it's not the case, and and it hasn't been the case. It's, it's a very useful alternative. Um, and it just depends on what you're doing. If you don't understand the transient nature of your signal, it's very powerful. If you do understand the transient nature of your signal, it, it doesn't buy you much. It buys you a little bit more time resolution, but poor frequency resolution. That's a whole nother, <laughs> nother course. Yeah. Um, Jose basically says, uh, uh, to, and this is for you, David, in your nuclear reactive study, did you detect any anthropogenic noises like lightning strikes? Yeah, well, lightning strikes we classified not as anthropogenic, but we detected both. So yes, to both. So we detected actual um, activities there. So we were able to detect certain operations, not all of them, it's not perfect. It's never really been done before. So yeah, we detected certain operations occurring at the labs. And on top of that, we detected lightning strikes coming through because, um, so this is Oak Ridge National Lab, this is in Tennessee. <laughs> so there's a lot of storms that tend to come through and, um, and actually, fortunate enough, the people that operate the nuclear reactor have to keep track of um, at lightning storms coming through because it can affect the reactor. They need to adjust um, the operations that occur there for safety and maintenance. So we were able to actually identify those signals. We saw the signal content. If you read that paper, um, we actually count those too. Um, so yeah, we were able to detect those lightning strikes on top of the anthropogenic activity occurring at the, at the nuclear reactor. So um, in Madison and... and uh... Dorian basically give um, some suggestions about some books that they found useful. So that, that's really good. Um, awesome. Thank you. And maybe we could post those on Slack. If you, that would be yeah. great. Um, yeah. And I could post mine too. In fact, that, I think that would be really good. So um, we have reached our time limit and I just wanna thank you for your time today. Hopefully you found this useful. Like I said, we start off very, very simple and you can see how it gets complex really fast. Um, you can spend a semester studying this, and this is, in fact, what I plan to present, you know, next year, um, next, I guess, this coming up fall and whatnot. So, um, uh, you know, when I was reading the profiles of, of you all, I, I know that a lot of you, hopefully you didn't find this too uh, simplistic um, um, and, 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 uh, and helpful. Um, uh, and we will monitor the Slack for a few days if you, if you have any questions. Um, but... Um, uh, I want to actually thank David. David designed that whole Jupyter notebook. I'm kind of lame o flame -o with that, the, the Python, a much more old school. But, um, you know, he's, he's pulled me along kicking and screaming. And is, one thing I want to emphasize is that your students teach you, can teach an old dog new tricks. And so uh, this has been really helpful for me too, working with him. And, uh, and I, you know, and, and David has a job lined up that's waiting for him. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I wanna thank you all for being with us today. Annette, did you have any other final questions or comments for us? Uh, no, I, I, I'll, just, I'll, just, uh, I'll just repeat that. Yeah, thank you both for, for this, this session. Um, yeah, and, and to all the attendees, just a reminder, feel free to post your suggestions and questions on the Unit 6 Slack channel. Uh, we'll make sure our instructors have access to them. And we'll upload this lecture to YouTube in the next uh, 24 hours uh, so, they, so the extern students can um, also view it. And yeah, 
uh, to them, feel free to post questions on the Slack channel. And we'll send a link to a Google form on the Slack channel for you to record your attendance. And uh, yeah, with that in mind, that's it. I think we'll see everyone next week for a module on earthquake location. Thank enjoy you again, Terrence. Yeah, practice. well, enjoy yeah. the rest of the course. And, and uh, it's, it's, you know, this is the one great thing that's come out of the pandemic is our ability to be able to connect uh, globally. I know there's students all over the world on this course. So um, uh, thank you for attending and uh, be well. And uh, um, hopefully we meet sometime face-to-face -face at some meeting. You come up to me and let me know. All right, take care. It was a pleasure. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>